Hey, welcome to Connection Church. My name is Steve and I'm happy to be connecting with you in this way on this day. Hey, hopefully you have been outside at least a little bit in this last uh, week to enjoy some of the summer-like weather. I don't know about you, but it has been so nice to actually just be outside in the mornings, um, whenever we can be, uh, soaking up some of the sun and the warmer weather. Even the breeze is, is getting warm, which is so great. I know we're still like early spring, are we mid spring? Uh, we're not at summer yet, but man, we'll take, we'll take the warm weather, that's for sure. Hey, uh, if you are leaning in with us right now, you are catching us partway through a series called Hello My Name Is. Actually, we're getting towards the end of it, next week's the end. Uh, but we, are, we have been looking at kind of different people in the faith, in one sense, uh, who we kind of know, but maybe don't know as well as we could. Uh, and, and when we say we know them, man, depending on where you're at in your faith journey, that could look completely different. So the first week we looked at God the Father or Yahweh. And the second week we looked at Jesus. Third week we looked at the Holy Spirit, which is just last week. And then today we're going to take a brief dive into what it is to, to be a Jesus follower. Hello, my name is... A Jesus follower and maybe that's you maybe you're someone who would identify as a Jesus follower or maybe you're not maybe you're just kind of still checking things out you've heard that Christians are pretty weird but maybe you've uh, been able to get to know a couple that at least piqued your interest that maybe there's more to this than you know regardless of where you're at we're happy that you're you're here with us today uh, for this message of this series. So if you have been part of Connection for a, even just a little while, you've maybe noticed that we tend to use the term Jesus follower more than we use the term Christian. Matthew 28, 19 records Jesus telling his followers to go and make disciples. While the term Christian means Christ-like, the term has kind of come to be watered down in our culture to simply mean anyone who believes in God. But it's actually so much more than that. So taking the mentality behind what it is to be a disciple and combining it with who it is we're a disciple of, we often just use the term Jesus follower and we love the intentionality that it brings. There's no dodging the fact that we're about Jesus and we're trying to follow him. So for our time together today, we want to continue in our series by taking a brief dive into the who we're focused on uh, of the life of a Jesus follower, because it is all about him. And if you are able to boil it down to just a couple of things, what those couple of things would be and what it looks like to live those out. So whether you're a longtime follower of Jesus, or if you you're way the other end of the spectrum and you're still kicking the tires of all this faith stuff. This is a great week. So no matter where you're at, let's be open. Let's be open to what God wants to speak to us. If you're a long timer, don't shut up, shut off and, and close up your mind and think, ah, oh, it's just the basics. I don't need to pay attention because there's always work to be done in the life of a Jesus follower. Because while I know I may not know you, I do know that none of us have arrived. No offense. We're going to quickly read through our two main scriptures today. And then we're going to pray and then roll up our sleeves and dig in. So let's check out the first one. This is Matthew 8. This is from the New Living Translation. It'll be up on the screen. But again, I encourage you to follow along in or on something. An actual Bible, you version, wherever. So this is chapter 8 in Matthew and verses 5 to 13. It says this. The section is called The Faith of a Roman Officer. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him. Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant 
will be healed. I know this because I'm under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he's talking about tons of people will, will be in heaven. He says, but many Israelites, for them, those whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is essentially saying there's a bunch of people who just, they, they talk the talk. They maybe think they're part of the kingdom. They're part of this Jesus follower thing, but they're not actually living it out. He finishes and says, Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, Go back home. Because you believed, it has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. Crazy story. And here's the other one we're going to look into. And this is John 2, verses 1 to 5. Jesus changes water into wine. Maybe this is a familiar story to you. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to them, said to him, sorry, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Before, before you get all upset, Jesus wasn't, it, this is not a degrading woman, like, you know, that gets most guys sent to the couch. This is just, uh, uh, could be translated as well, mother, okay? So he's, Jesus is not being disrespectful. He says, my hour has not yet come. She doesn't even acknowledge what he said. It says, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So two segments of scripture that I think define two major characteristics, defining characteristics of what it is to be a Jesus follower. Before we get to that, let's just pray. God, thank you so much uh, for who you are and how you pursue us. Even those who don't yet know you or, or think that they fully believe in you, God, you're pursuing all people because of your love for them. So thank you for this time that we have together today to look into your word, that we can be encouraged, that we can be challenged. And regardless of where we're at, may we open ourselves up to hear from you. So thanks, thanks for your love. Thanks for your patience with us uh, when you're telling us things time and time again and we don't necessarily get it the first time. God, thank you. Thank you for this time and, and for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so are any of you familiar with the TV show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? That show terrifies me. I would, I would absolutely hate to be on that show, partly because if they would just in, ask me initially, are you smarter than a fifth grader? I would probably just voluntarily say no. Um, not because I, I think I haven't academically gone past grade five. It's that you cover some basic things early in school. They're familiar to you. And then as you grow up, continue to like do life, you don't go back to those things. You don't think about a bunch of them, right? So am I smarter than a fifth grader? Like, yes, dot, dot, dot. But I know there's going to be questions on that TV show that would be more familiar to them, more recent to them than it would be to me. And I, I'm sorry, I would just, I would look like a complete fool on that TV show. Or have you seen where they've done street interviews where they'll just walk up to people and they'll say, hey, do you feel like you know our country? And run. I would run if someone came up to me 
to, to ask me questions like that. It's not that I don't know our country, but I don't, I don't spend a whole lot of time re-going through the geography, the capitals, the locations, the all the kinds of things they would ask on shows or interviews like that that you blank on. Are you that type of person that maybe you have the knowledge, you've got the knowledge, you are smarter than a fifth grader, but no offense if you're a fifth grader, but in the moment you would, you would blank. You would forget everything that you know, except maybe your name. Hopefully you'd get that right. But, but some people on the spot, it's like, I, I don't know anything. You know, what province do you live in? Uh, Ontario. What province is directly next to us on the West? Do you know what I mean? Like it's simple questions like that, that in for a split second, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't name another province in Canada or what country lies to the South of us. Do you know what I mean? Like we blank on some of these things. And again, sometimes it's just in the moment. Sometimes it's because we haven't gone over that basic foundational information in a long time. And so are we smarter than a fifth grader? Maybe the answer is not yes or no. Maybe it's, I used to be, <laughs> who knows? Maybe I just know more information in other areas now. Here's the thing. It doesn't have to be in big moments like TV shows or street interviews. We can forget basic knowledge when it comes to tests. Are you someone that freezes up on tests? Or, or maybe in like a job interview, you are not at your relaxed. And that is so hard because they're trying to get a snapshot of who you are. And you're like cold and awkward and rigid and you don't know what to say or where to look. Maybe it's when you met your spouse, the person you're married to now. You saw him or her for the first time and you, you couldn't even put a sentence together. They were just so beautiful and so intelligent. I don't know. I don't know, maybe that's your situation. Or maybe, maybe it's eating something fantastic. Like you finally get that piece of cake you've been craving and someone tries to talk to you while you're midway through that piece of cake and you, you can't form a sentence or even care to because you're just enjoying that food. Um, as I joke about this, there are, some, there are some situations that I think are less than hilarious when we forget basic things that we want to kind of have in line. M maybe it's an unexpected conversation. Someone looks you dead in the eye who you've got you know, a medium amount of relationship with and, and they say, how are you actually doing right now? And, and you're at a loss for words. You're just like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I'm, I'm not great, but I can surface level focus on some things that maybe they're great. Or maybe someone says, hey, I've seen you in some pretty crazy situations. And, and this faith that you have, I want to know more. Can you, can you just sum it up? Can you tell me why? why you, you, you ascribe to this faith and, and you're just like, uh, 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 right? You're put on the spot because you haven't necessarily taken the opportunity to think, what would I say to somebody in, in a clip of a moment about why I believe what I believe? And so it's why it's an awesome thing to be reminded of, of why we those of us who would describe to be Jesus followers, why we believe this, what it's all about. It helps us recenter and refocus. Do you know how to define what you believe, no matter where, where you're at on the belief scale? The basics of our faith, of a Jesus following faith, are what we build off in our own personal lives and also what we share from. If we're not sure really how to talk about what we believe, it's really hard to grow in that. And it's really exponentially harder to share with somebody else. So if we're in this Jesus follower life, we, we really need to know what it's all about and what it all boils down to. And, and maybe you've done this before and you've come up with some things that you can, that you can rhyme off pretty quick and, and you can have a great conversation with somebody at the drop of a hat. That, and that's awesome. 
And so while there are a few different ways I think you could do this, two things that we see in Scripture I think that are absolutely necessary to live this life of faith are belief and surrender. Belief and surrender. And we see them reflected in the Scriptures that we read. So let's jump back into them and, and dig through them a little bit. The first one we, we read through was, was the Roman centurion or the Roman officer. And so as we kind of dig in a little bit on this idea that belief, which maybe you're thinking, duh, like of course belief matters, but like it really, really matters. In, in the scripture that we read, the officer kind of stops Jesus and, and he says, just say the word from where you are. So not only two things are going on in this, in this moment, the, the officer has just said, essentially like, I'm not worthy for you to, to come to my house, which that's great. He's, he's honoring, he's revering Jesus. But his faith comes in, this, his belief system comes in when he says, because he, he thinks Jesus doesn't even have to be in the room. He says, just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. This is crazy. This is an unbelievable moment of belief because he's he's saying out loud, he's confessing to Jesus that I believe the who you are, the power that you have is so great that you don't even have to be in the room. You don't have to be touching the person. You command healing so greatly that you don't, you can stay right where you are. And because you just speak it to be, it will be. Man, what a, what a moment of faith. What a moment of, of just being open and honest with his beliefs and, and saying who he believes Jesus to be. Do, do we do we believe that? Do you, are your beliefs of God and Jesus that set in stone? Are your beliefs of, of the Holy Spirit, are they that strong? Are they that cemented? It's, this is a pretty crazy moment. So crazy that Jesus stops. He looks around kind of to make sure he has everyone's attention, right? You know that moment of dead air. Jesus Jesus grabs that pause, that awkward pause moment. And man, he squeezes it for all it's worth. He looks around and says, and he says, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Man, what a moment. The Scripture doesn't even say that, that the Roman officer went into any big, great, poetic moment of who he, all he believed Jesus to be. He was just exercising his beliefs and saying, I believe you are so powerful that you are so in command of healing, right? This one specific area. You you could just speak it and it'll happen. Man, this is crazy. And then when we filter this in to the series that we're in the midst of, and we've been looking at God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and, and the Holy Spirit, man, it begs the question of where are your beliefs in those things, right? We started to take a, we took a brief look at each person. We looked at God and the many names of God because of his many characteristics. He is a healer. He is a creator. He is loving. He is a shepherd. He's all these things, right? Do you believe them or, or do you just read them? Right? This is the question that's before us as we look at our beliefs being an absolutely central part of being a Jesus follower. It's one thing to say something. It's another thing to believe it. So do we believe all that Scripture says about God? And then Jesus, do we believe the things that are written about Jesus? Because absolutely, if you've dug into any of them, a lot of them are pretty crazy. And you can see from the reactions of people present day back then that some of what he said was really offensive, was really like against the cultural 
norms. Do you believe who Jesus says he is? And do you believe the things that happened to him? That he died and he rose again? Do you believe the things that we've talked about about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that as a Jesus follower, whether you are one or not, you get the gift of the Holy Spirit inside you when you've given your life to Jesus? So if you're not yet a Jesus follower, this is not something that's necessarily uh, something you have ascribed to yet, but you can see, you can understand that when you make that decision, you get the gift of, of the Holy Spirit. And if you are a Jesus follower, you have it in you. But do we, remember last week we talked about, do we take the time? Do we make the request, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit, that we'd be Spirit-filled and better to be Spirit-led in that sense? Do you believe these things about the Holy Spirit or do you just talk about them or sweep them under the rug like a lot of churches do at times because we don't know all there is to know about the Spirit. So, well, maybe we won't talk about it a whole lot. How's your belief system? Who we believe God is shapes who we are if we're Jesus followers. If, if you only believe Him to be certain things, it changes who you are as a Jesus follower. If you don't think He's really a healing God because He hasn't done the things you wanted Him to do as a healing God, that's going to change who and how you are as a Jesus follower. And, and this, this belief system that we would hold to of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's, it's actually supposed to be regardless of our circumstances. Right? We don't just say God is a healer because He's done the healing that we want. We don't say God is a creator or a provider just because He's given us the job that we want. The, the moment that our faith, the rubber hits the road, if you will, is do we still believe Him to be these things when things aren't going our way? Do we still believe the Holy Spirit is with us when we don't feel Him? Right? Things like that. This can be so hard, but it really is where our beliefs are refined. We see this in love, right? If you are in love with somebody, it's not just for when times are good. That love is really shown when times aren't good and you choose to fight for and lean into that person uh, that you would love or commitments that you've made right? Maybe in your job or maybe on a, a sports team or something. When you have loss after loss on the sports team, are you still committed to the team? Right? It's something that holds true despite the circumstances. So as far as this idea that beliefs, our beliefs are so core and central to who and how we are as a Jesus follower. Secondly, surrender. We talked about surrender and we looked at John 2, 5, when Jesus turns water into wine. What a, what a moment this must have been. Um, kind of a background thing, these, these big jars uh, of water that, that Jesus asked the servants to fill, they were for people washing their hands in. Now, while he asked them, the servants, to fill them with, with new water, they still, I don't know, did they wash them out? I mean, they weren't clean jars necessarily to begin with. So Jesus took this, this moment to turn, to turn water in, in washing jars into the, if you read further in the story, into the best wine they had that night. I mean, that's besides the point. But still, an awesome, awesome moment. Jesus changes the water into wine. So the, so the wine that they had had brought to the party had run out. Jesus' mother comes to him and says, hey, like, there's a problem. Jesus says, hey, what are you doing? Mom, mom, it's not my time to be doing these things in public, right? He says, my time has not yet come. But it's really funny, the confidence that we see in his mom. It's like, was he doing like little miracles at home? Because she certainly came to him with confidence, 
right? Almost exercising some of that belief we're talking about as well. But she says, hey, like, can you do something about this? He responds, right, in saying, hey, it's not my time. She doesn't even acknowledge that. So funny, the dynamic, hey, between Jesus and his mom. And so she, instead of acknowledging what Jesus has said, she just says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Man, this line, this line calls for complete surrender in the servants. Because this line says, hey, your minds may be about to be blown. Jesus may do things that you're not expecting or in a way that you wouldn't have lined things up yourself. Do whatever he tells you. I think this line is something that that reaches out to us in the same sense, that complete surrender. Will, Will we do whatever Jesus tells us? If you call yourself a Jesus follower, will you follow Jesus? Will you do whatever he tells you? I mean, this opens us up to hear from God, if we will. If we have our own plans and our own way that we're just so set on, we haven't surrendered that. And so it's that much harder to hear from God when we tell him, no, 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 I've got my own plans for whatever area it is in our life. It's submitting to His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that's in every Jesus follower. It's surrendering, saying, yeah, okay, I'll listen to you. Even if it blows my mind, even if it is counterintuitive, even if it's uncomfortable. You see, surrender is another massive area, critical, central area to the life of a Jesus follower. And here's the thing, one area doesn't work if the other area is not there. The belief and surrender. Because let's look at this for a second. Belief without surrender means we're not really listening to God. We may believe He's great and all-powerful, but if we're not willing to surrender every area of our life, I mean, I think it puts some questions into our belief, but it becomes something that just exists on paper. It it takes the life away from from actually living as a Jesus follower, and it is just maybe like you've just written it on a name tag. Hey, I'm a Jesus follower, and that's where it ends. Belief without surrender means we won't hear from God or be open to His plan in our life because we're unwilling to surrender certain areas of our life. And then the other way, surrender without belief, like if we're someone who's like, I'll, I'll give everything I have and all that I am to anything, right? If your belief system isn't in God, but you're more than willing to surrender yourself, man, we'll be swayed by anything. And we could end up in a wrong direction in no time. Or, let's not even say it's a wrong direction. Let's just say that it's, what's the meaning of it? I mean, you're doing stuff. You're busy. You're maybe helping people with things that involve their time and their energy here on earth. But, but what's the lasting impact of what you're doing if it's not connected to what God's called you to? These two things, belief and surrender, speak to what it is to be a Jesus follower, to be a disciple, right? As we mentioned, that's our, that's our calling is to go and make disciples. It's to go encourage other people with the message of hope and purpose that we have that's found in Jesus and all he's done for us. But it's then to encourage those people who make that decision to dig in to their beliefs solidify those beliefs and also seek for full surrender that we're all in. Now listen, you may be listening to this and thinking, no, no, wait, love, love should be one. There should be a third thing. It should be love. 
Okay, love is definitely a buzzword for sure around Christianity, and it's it's more than that. It's more than a buzzword. It's it's something that's often mentioned because it's all through Jesus' teachings. But I would say that love really is a byproduct of the belief and surrender. Our beliefs, our beliefs show us how to love. If we believe that God is love, we believe Jesus is who he says he is, and, and we believe what happened, what the scriptures describe of his life, we see what love is. So our beliefs show us how to love, and our surrender shows us who to love, right? Because it's easy to love the people that are comfortable to love, the people who love you, the people who are maybe even like you, or... But if we're in complete surrender, then we're open to love the people that God wants us to love, that the spirit inside a Jesus follower is going to convict us and nudge us to go love that person in such a way. So I would say, I would challenge the fact that love is a byproduct that comes out when we have our belief system in place, when we have fully surrendered. You can love people without having a relationship with God, but it's, it's not on the level that you can when you do have belief in Him and surrender to Him. I just think it hits another level. We can meet people's needs and that apart from God, but I, th I think those are temporary needs. We want to be about the things that have lasting impact in people's lives, loving them in such a way like Jesus did that made them want more, that made them interested in what this faith thing was all about. Now, let me just quickly address the minimum in each area because I know that that's often how our human brains work. And I don't want to mention this because it's an easy way out. Hey, uh, hey, here, just hit the minimum and, uh, and then you'll be good. I mention this because I think it's a benchmark. That it's like, hey, if you're a Jesus follower, we better make sure we're hitting at least this. So with our belief, Romans 10, 9, we mentioned this before in previous week, says this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Listen, this is the minimum for where our beliefs need to be at as a Jesus follower. Obviously, without this, without this belief, we're not a Jesus follower. But to those of you who are new and you're looking at the things maybe we've talked about in previous weeks, then maybe you're not quite there yet. And that's okay. This minimum of believing Jesus is who he says he is. And he's done what scriptures tell us he's done. Is the part where we need to start from to grow from. That we would be willing to lean into all these other areas to say, God, show me more of who you are. Jesus, convince me of all the things that you've done. May I just, may I own them and believe them um, in, in such a way that is, is encouraging to the spirit that's within me and, and engaging to the people that I'm around. And the Holy Spirit absolutely works in ways that are mysterious. But God, show me, right? These are the ways that we can really encourage growth in ourselves and surrender i have i have kind of bad news for the minimum for surrender <laughs> it's all of us it's it's all of us there's no minimum or maximum god wants all of you i mean if you think of let's think of a pie chart just for a second and, and the different pieces of pie would be kind of the segments of your life as a, as a Jesus follower, if you would ascribe to that. You've got a segment of, that's, that's time. You've got a slice of pie that's finances. You've got a slice of pie that's energy. You've got a slice of pie that's plans for today. And you've got another one that's plans for tomorrow. I know some of you are arguing, what about this piece of pie and that piece of pie? Sure, there's maybe more pieces of pie. But let's just take these, for example. Are we willing 
to be fully surrendered in even just those areas. Because that's God wants all of your surrender in your time. As a Jesus follower, he wants all of your surrender in your finances, in your energy, in your plans for today, in your plans for tomorrow. And what that looks like is simply saying, God, show me what you want me to do with my time. Show me what you want me to do with my finances, with my energy, with my plans for today. And absolutely for my plans for tomorrow. Who we believe God is, right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Who we believe Him to be not only shapes who we are, but also who others will believe Him to be. Because people are watching. The moment that you say you're a Jesus follower, people are watching. And the degree, the degree to which we surrender to what we believe shows just how committed we are to that very thing. So, if you're a Jesus follower, where's the Holy Spirit saying you need to lean in a bit more? Maybe it's in your beliefs, to trust Him, to be more for you than you have previously believed. Maybe it's to lean into an aspect of Him that's out of your comfort zone. Or maybe the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you need to lean in more with your surrender. Is there an area that you haven't fully given him? You give him like a little piece of the pie, but he wants wants that whole piece. Sometimes, here's the tricky thing, sometimes we think we've given him everything, but we're blind to an area because our enemy wants us to continue holding it. And in those moments, or if that's a possibility, which it is for all of us, I think it's, it's when a verse of Scripture just jumps out in my mind. It's two verses from Psalm 139. It says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. In other words, God, search me. Search me and find anything that's not right. And so I think this almost needs to be a regular prayer of the Jesus follower so that we allow him to point out areas that we may not even be paying attention to. The life of a Jesus follower is an incredibly powerful thing, both for and can be against our faith, depending on how we live it out. It's not only important for our own day to day, but it's critical for those who are watching. And we'll dive deeper into that next week as we look at, hello, my name is your neighbor. Let's pray. God, thank you again for this time that we have together today to look at your word, to be encouraged, God, as we reflect on on who you are, But as we reflect also, maybe learn really what it boils down to, to be a Jesus follower. That we would have our beliefs in you. That we would be looking to grow in our beliefs, to solidify our beliefs in you. But that we would also look to fully surrender, to be all in in every area that we would offer up it all to you, however you want to use it. God, I thank you for your patience with us. For those who've been around faith for a long time and and we're we're still trying to get it right, thank you for your patience with us. And God, for those who are maybe new to faith, God, I I pray that you continue to grow them. And for those who who haven't decided to trust you yet, God, I pray that they will. Maybe even in this moment that they would say, okay, Jesus, I don't have all the answers, but I've been trying things my own way. 
And I want to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that that you are who you say you are. And you, you died for my mistakes. You paid the penalty for my sin. And I will look to try and live my life centered around you, that, that I'll look to you to grow my beliefs. And I will look to you to help me surrender every area of my life. God, thanks for who you are to each of us. And again, that you pursue us and for this time together that we've had today. Just bless our conversation uh, for those who are going into groups and, and, and thanks that you'll walk with us into the week that's to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again. Thanks for making time for this, for this leaning in to, uh, to, to listen to this message, but also hopefully you're about to jump into a group. Um, we're so excited that we have our groups, that we have group leaders. Again, if you're within the area, send us a message on social, um, send us an email, jump on our website, whatever you need to do to get in touch with us. We'd love to get you plugged in. Otherwise, we'll talk to you, talk to you soon. Have a great week.